I guess we're letting a lot of cats out of the bag today, but yeah, probably yeah. too many. You might have to go back and eat some of those. <laughs> John Myers, how you doing, man? Doing, doing very good. Uh, John, I don't even know where to start, man. I've, I've, I've had a lot of people tell me that I need to interview you, and as you know, I've been trying for a long time. We just been a hard, hard to line up our schedules, but finally, finally, we're here. <sighs> John, I don't even know where to start, man. Uh, how, how many national championships? You you became like mid-range king. I won uh, four mid-range. I won 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018 mid-range. And then I won the 2016 and 2019 Southwest Nationals. Wow. that's And uh, the mid-ranges, three of the four were national records for the three-day ag with the last <laughs> the last one. Was a 1800 with 133 X's. Wow! So that was the last one. 1800. That means you didn't you didn't drop any points. It's three. I had 600 for three days. Wow! That's and impressive. The, that last relay on the last day, last relay, my first, my two siders were nines <laughs> on both, <laughs> both sides of the target. Wow! I had to lay my head down for a second and and uh, and start praying because I thought, man, this is. You know, I just need one more claim. Yeah. Nobody's ever shot three days clean at a national. Uh-huh. And my next shot, I don't remember what the next shot was, but once we got going, that it was, you I think I had 15, 15 X's or something on that last relay. Wow. And just, that is very impressive. So let's back it up to when I met you. Uh, how did you even get started? Uh, you were started with an AR or something? I started with an AR-15. I, I went to a couple state matches here in Texas, and uh, I hung out with bench rest guys mm -hmm. here at our local range. So they made fun of me constantly about the AR-15s, but they were helping me. And uh, we modified the first AR-15. By the time I got done modifying it, I was driving home from the range one day, and I got thinking, you know, if you buy a stripped lower, you can put the original gun back together. And so I did. <laughs> I, I ordered the stripped lower and put the original one back together like it was new. But uh, we had that gun down in the 0.18 uh, five-shot group range. Wow. AR-15 with a 26-inch Krieger barrel. Wow. And, and one of my buddies out there just kept telling me, he said, if you ever get a real gun, you might you might be able to shoot. <laughs> and uh, so I took that gun to a state match and did pretty good with it. And uh, <clears throat> I missed shooting a high master score by one point. Wow. And uh, – and after I left, I shot with David Mann that whole weekend. And uh, on his, I shot with him for two days. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I left, I told Deborah, I said, uh, David just won won this match. I said, that's who I want to beat. I said, I got to build another gun. And that's that's when we started building the F-Open gun. And you and did. The, I'm going to fast we forward. Beat him. Three, three, four months later, we won the long-range state championship in Houston. <sighs> All right, man. I just got chills because um, – I mean, this is quite a leap. I mean, you know that, right? Looking back now, you go, wow, that was... Back then, you didn't know what you know now, but winning the Texas State Championship, it ain't it ain't no easy then, feat. No, it wasn't easy. And a bunch of the U.S. shooting team guys were there that week. Yeah. Uh, at that match. I mean, I was there, and I, all of a sudden, I, I had no idea who you were, right? Because this is, this is, you just showed up. I mean, that's what it appeared like, Right. And that was sudden, only the second or third time I'd shot at a thousand yards. I know, I, but like I said, I didn't know you, and I was a regular at Bayou at the time, right? I used to shoot quite often there, and all of a sudden, this John Myers guy just just lighting it on fire. And I mean, I remember, I remember <laughs> uh, watching your target while you were shooting, and I was like, "Holy crap, that gun shoots!" I mean, it was it was impressive. That was probably the best barrel I ever had. I hate to admit it, but <laughs> I finally, when I got into the 300 WSM, I had barrels as good. But that first <clears throat> barrel was just unbelievable. The only way you could lose a match is if I did something wrong. And uh, it was it was impressive. So you did. <laughs> so what happened from? I, I don't even know where to, how far to go back because that AR-15 shooting into ones that's that's hard to do with a bolt gun. With a big gun. Yeah, and I took that same gun out to the range probably three or four months ago just to shoot it because I hadn't shot it in 12 years. And I found some ammo in the uh, cabinet loaded 12 years ago. And it, I, I shot two shots, and I adjusted the scope, and I did two shots. 
adjusting the scope, and then I did four shots, and it was .20. <laughs> 12 years <laughs> later, with 12-year-old ammunition, I thought, well, it still shoots. <laughs> that and I is, put it back. Put, that is put it quite, away. quite impressive. Uh, and so, I, that, gun, that gun had a tuner on it. One of yeah. my bench press buddies was laughing one day, and he said, you need a tuner on that gun. And I said, okay. And uh, he goes, take the barrel off and bring it over tonight. And we threaded it for a tuner. And, that, and that's what that actually got started? us down. That's, oh, that's when I got messing with tuners. But that got me down to 0.18. Before that, I was at a quarter inch. Wow. And we put the tuner on, and it got us down to the point, point 0.1 range. So, and, you know, tuners, they, they, they are quite a quite a – quite a it's like a cheat code right it, it's it's sometimes and you know a quarter moe gun is a good gun oh, yeah. and yeah. and people always ask me well do tuners make a difference and i said it'll change how your barrel shoots i can't guarantee that that it'll make them better i just know that it's going to change it there's there's this possibility that you know you are already there but more than likely you're not but you won't know until you throw a tuner on there and you know well the problem with uh, the problem with not having a tuner so you get you get ready for a national championship you drive 1100 miles to get there and your gun won't shoot yeah now what do you do you can't you're you're loaded everything's done you, yeah. you have nothing you can change seating depths maybe if you didn't already pre-seat but you're done yeah but if, but if you got a tuner you reach up and turn it one way. If it gets better, turn it again. If it gets worse, go the other way, and you'll find it. Yeah, you'll make and, it suit. And we have unlimited sighters. Um, I did that. Uh, I had a rifle that just wasn't shooting very well, and it was the last day at Nationals. I don't know which year. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm just going to tune my tuner during unlimited ciders and i did I, I, sh I shot like 25 ciders and uh <laughs> jay christopherson was scoring for me and then i i went ahead and after i tuned it i shot a clean got a gold medal you know it's uh so so that was your first exposure to a tuner and because <clears throat> you used tuner your entire time you, you had the tuners. entire time yeah every every match i've ever shot guns including the AR, ar-15 had a tuner on now, I didn't really know, and, and what's weird about the tuner on the AR-15, once I tuned it, even the other day when I took it out and shot it, I never turned the tuner. It's still set at the yeah. original spot, <laughs> and it's happy there. Now, I could probably tweak it a little bit. Get I could have probably got the group down a little bit more. But even 12 years later, on a random day, the 12-year-old ammunition, it still shoots. It's still in a in a happy spot. Yeah. And, uh, that's the big matches. I, I usually turn my tuners. You see me doing it all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, you uh, are the only person that uh, I have seen do that with success. That because I've seen people do it, but you do it successfully. What was funny is the first match I went to, which was the Southwest Nationals in 2011. Yeah, you know, I was new. I mean, I'd only been shooting F class <laughs> for six months. I'm walking up and down, looking at everybody's guns, and nobody has a tuner but me. 2011. And that, 2011. I, I had a tuner, but the the way I made mine was to to make it look like I didn't have a tuner. And, and, and I may not have saw. I may I, not have saw you. I was but see the 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 intent of mine was to hide it in plain sight, right? Yeah. Uh, because it was such an advantage when I started using tuners. I was like, holy smokes! Like I don't want this to get out, you know. So that's that's the reason my tuner is seamless. It, it unless you really look, you can't well, really you tell. Can't tell you can't tell it's there. Yeah, so that and, was actually <clears throat> by design. And then six months later, I went to a, a big event, and half the guns on the line had tuners, and then a year later, all the guns had a tuner. Yep. Everybody yep. picked up on them, but they still never figured out how to use them. And I was close for the first five years. I was close, <clears throat> but it took me about five years before I finally got it right. I was off just a little bit. So if I was near a data point when I was shooting, the gun shot light, lights out. But if I was away from the data point, it wasn't going to shoot. And, and it took me four or five years to figure that out. And uh, finally, I figured it out in Phoenix. And it was a practice day or something. I went down there every two hours and set my gun up, and I shot like 10 rounds. And I was playing with the tuner. I'd get it to shoot, and then I'd go back down two hours later. I'd leave the tuner where it was at, and then I would shoot on both sides. 
And then two hours later, you know, I just kept doing it and I kept yeah. searching. And when I got done, I knew how to drive the tuner. It showed up. <laughs> That's and, impressive. Uh, and so, then I've been driving them ever since. So you, before F-Class, you were uh, doing some type of racing? Oh, I've gotten, I've done shifter cart racing and I did some off-road car racing. Uh, I was into rebuilding wrecked Harleys for a couple of years. I just oh. liked working on stuff. So I'd buy uh, Harleys that were about, I, I wouldn't buy anything more than two years old, but they were wrecked and uh, they had clean titles. And I, I was buying them from a online company and I'd just buy them and fix them. And I'd, I'd ride them while they were for sale. Uh, once they sold, then I'd get another one. Right. And I did. I did eight or ten of them. Wow, that's uh, that's awesome. So, so you figure out the tuner, but before that, this is this is when you decide you're going to build a rifle. I, I want I want to go back to when you, you you're driving home and you tell your wife, I'm, I'm I got to do this. I got to build a, a real rifle, and I got to I got to beat David Mann because you know David Mann. <sighs> I always refer to David Mann as the best shooter I have ever met that has never won the Nationals. He is, exactly. in my opinion, one of the one of the. He's a great shooter, man. I, I he's a great shooter. He is a great shooter. Um, and uh, the problem with that, you know, F class guns is it takes a year or two sometimes to build a gun. And I wanted to go to the long range national or the state championship uh, four months later. And uh, Jerry Stiller, uh, Bill Stiller, you know, Stiller Precision. Mm -hmm. I went over the next day. I took a vacation day, went over to Jerry's and was begging for an action. <laughs> and uh, he finally pulled one out of his gun safe that he was saving for himself. Mm -hmm. And I bought that. And then as soon as he found me an action, I said, okay, I need a Robinson stock, which you couldn't get him at the time. And I kept asking him, I said, what, what was you going to put this action in? And he goes, well, I've got, <laughs> I've got a stock for me. And I said, well, you don't have an action now. I need that stock. <laughs> and... Within a couple of hours, I left with a, a, I had a stock and an action in my hand, <laughs> and and before I left, uh, you know, I'd already called Bruno's and had a barrel uh, heading my, and heading towards my house and triggers, mm -hmm. and within you know three or four days, I had I had all the parts I needed to build an class rifle. Okay, and uh, and it just worked out. And uh, who built your Larry, rifle? Hmm? Who built your rifle? Uh, Jerry uh, Jerry actually built it for me. Okay. And then about a month later, I was up in uh, Raton. I went to Larry Bartholomew's F-Class shooting school. He, he uh -huh. did that one year. Uh -huh. And uh, Speedy went in and did some – some. Uh, Speedy went in and re-bedded it. Uh -huh. uh, he changed the bedding in it. Uh -huh. And uh, it was just a little – it was good, but it was a little bit – seemed a little bit loose. Uh -huh. So he just went in and uh, re-bedded it. Uh -huh. And uh, – but that was the gun. I shot that gun for four or five years, I guess. It was a black gun, right? It was a black gun, yeah. Yeah, I remember yep. that. It terrorized us for a while. <laughs> so, so you show up to the Texas State Championship, right? And like you said, it's only like your third time. What was it like? What was your, did you set goals? I mean, obviously you wanted to win, right? But what led up to that? I mean, you didn't just decide, oh, I'm going to build a gun. I'm just going to show up and I'm going to win. I mean, there had to be some preparation that went, went into Well, the months before that, I went down to Houston and shot the club match. And that's when the day before the club match, the U.S. shooting team had their tryout there in Houston. And I, did, I didn't know it. So I'm, I, I showed up. I probably showed up the day of the tryout just to go out to the range early because I'd never been there before. And then mm -hmm. here they are doing a tryout. And uh, so I got talking to them and they said, oh, you should have tried out. And I said, well, I didn't know about it. <laughs> and so I got online and it said you had to be – uh, he had to finish in the top three in the state championship to qualify to try Long out range. for the team. Long range. Long range. Yeah. So I knew I had to finish in the top three at the long at the state champion at the state match. Mm -hmm. And uh, I burnt that barrel up testing for the next month. Wow. And when I came back, it was shooting, and uh, and I shot that whole uh, two days without turning the tuner. Mm -hmm. And and I was so nervous on the first day I was shooting. I was going to turn, turn the tuner, but I forgot. And I got to the end of the day and realized I hadn't been turning the tuner. So I just thought, well, I'm not going to turn it tomorrow either. <laughs> right. And uh, and it just shot incredible. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. The, the tune that I had was just so wide that it, it was allowing, allowing me not to turn it. 
right. and that's one of the secrets with tuners. You're looking for a wide thing, not not a real small group with with it blowing up on both sides. You're right. looking for a, a wide thing. Yeah, what I always will say. What I always tell people is don't read individual groups. Read the patterns. How 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 you know? Read the neighboring groups as well. Because if you have you a, got you've got to read the neighboring groups. Yeah. And if if there's a huge change in elevation on, on a neighboring group, that's a bad tune. Because the weather's going to change, and you're going to you're going to end up in that spot. Well, worse is you're going to you're going to you know you have to to you're going to get stuck between the two, right? And if there's not right. enough of a change, you're going to you're going to shoot high and low because right you're right in the middle. It's it's a really bad spot to be, you know. Yeah, the, uh, the first uh, barrel that I had that won it won two it won the mid range 2015 mid range and it won the. Uh, I think it won the 2016 Southwest Nationals, that okay. barrel. Okay. When I tested it in Houston, I was shooting three or four shot groups at 1,000 yards. And, and I I just set the tuner. I shoot four. I had nine red dots on the target at 1,000 yards because I couldn't run down and pull my own target. So I'd just aim at the one dot, and I would shoot. I think I shoot four shots, and then I'd turn the tuner about three clicks, uh, which is about a tenth of a turn. You know, four shots, turn it again, four shots. And I went all the way through those nine points. And when I went down and got my target, the first group was seven inches. The second group was one inch. The third group was six inches. The fourth group was about four and a half inches. Uh, the fifth group was three and a half. And then the sixth group was three. And the seventh group was three. The eighth group was three. And the ninth group was three and a half. Yeah, so. And the elevation on all the threes was the same elevation. So which out of all those groups, which one do you think I picked? Well, you picked the three, you know, and you probably went to the middle of the node. I mean, that seemed like a pretty wide node. Just go right in the yeah, middle. Pick, right in the middle. Yeah. That, see, a lot of people go for the one inch. And right? that's what I was doing. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. But my tune charts were wrong for those first three or four years. So it would go out of tune. Right. If I was shooting exactly on that data point, it would shoot incredible. But if it wasn't near the data point, it wouldn't shoot. Right. So I went to the three, middle of the threes, and that barrel won two nationals. Won a mid-range and a long range. That's what makes Phoenix so hard. Yeah. Yeah, wow. that's why I love Phoenix. John <laughs> loves Phoenix. <laughs> Yeah, John loves a, a, a place that that has a lot of variables because you figured out the variables, right? Yeah. The I always say the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and yeah. uh, you know you figured out how to be friends with the with the variables. I want huge temperature changes, <laughs> and because uh, he because your your gun's gonna go out of tune. Yeah. On a huge temperature change, and and, and mine's not. So here's what makes it um, more drastic, right? And it's the unknown. So what is a barrel tuner? A barrel tuner is a device that attaches to the end of the barrel that allows you to tune the barrel harmonics in order to shrink your groups as best as possible. There are multiple types. Here at Cortina Precision, we have what we call the next generation easy tuner brake. This is a tuner and a muzzle brake combined. Now, if you're simply looking for a barrel tuner for your, let's say, rimfire rifle or even an air rifle, then the easy tuner V2 is probably going to be the best option for you. This tuner uses a spring to eliminate backlash and provide the most repeatable results. In order for you to attach it to your rifle, you can either have the barrel threaded by a gunsmith to attach the tuner directly, but that requires an inch 250 barrel, or you can use one of our adapters. These adapters come threaded in multiple different threads, half 20, half 28, three quarter 24, so you can attach this tuner to just about any barrel out there, including your rimfire or your air rifle. Visit shootsmallgroups.com, go to our store, and take a look around. Also, you can go on YouTube and search for Easy Tuner, and you'll see a lot of videos out there that show what our tuners can do for you. The gun goes out of tune, and a lot of people will automatically blame it on the range, blame it on the Mirage. You know what I mean? They have something to blame. They don't realize it's their gun that just went out. It's it and 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 the the worst part is 
like that. It, it gradually changes. And, you know, in F-Class, we shoot, I don't know, every two, three hours. So when they go shoot again, it's it's different, and they just assume it's the range, right? Right. My favorite excuse is when they say the range as vertical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The range is thrown vertical. And, and I'm like, really? Yeah, it's not throwing, not in my lane. <laughs> yeah, my lane's okay. <laughs> you, I notice you always got those those good lanes. Yeah, mine, mine always, I don't have those lanes, those lanes with vertical. <laughs> so, uh, you were always really quiet, really kept to yourself. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, I just started, the way I approach is just start giving you a hard time. That's that was my way to approaching you. You know what I mean, and uh, <laughs> you took it well. And and then you started dishing it back out, you know, at me. And and then we just, I just really enjoyed seeing you at matches because we would always give each other a little crap. But uh, how did how did how did this conversation happen when you told me you you, you told me that I had never beat you? At, uh, that was down in Houston, and right. that was the. I dropped 12 points on the first day on the first match, and you dropped like one. Uh -huh. And I was just done. I mean, I just, I was just thinking, there's no catching up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I almost got you. Yeah, you did. And I couldn't believe it. I, I almost I, caught back up. I thought you ended up what second or third? I think second. so. I think I was, second. I think I dropped one too many points on my last train. If I I dropped one and, and you and you, you ended up winning, so I, I probably lost second on that match. Yeah. So the first string, somehow, obviously it was it was a surprise to everybody, including yourself, to drop twelve points when everybody else is dropping one or two. I mean, it was tricky, but I mean, it was. I mean, you know, you 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 knew how to deal with that. So, what what happened that day in that one string? I shot like five shots and and siders and they were all Xers. And I turned and looked at my scorekeeper and I said, "Okay, it's going to record." And I laid down. And my first shot was a seven, horizontal seven. Wow. And I'm like, wow. And uh, so I corrected for it and shot a seven out the other side. There's yeah. six points <clears throat> in two shots. Yeah. And by then you're a little flustered, so I mean you're gonna. I think I dropped a couple more points, and uh, then I stopped. But I just couldn't get, you know, I ended up dropping 12 points. Yeah. But six of them were in two shots. My first two shots were record. Yeah, and after that, you, I mean, you, you, you pretty much won everything after that. But it just, I mean, that was a big well, what deficit. Was, what was funny is because after that, I didn't care. Right. I just thought, I, there's no way I can catch up. So I just... I was having fun and, and doing my best, but there was no pressure. Right. The pressure didn't show up to that last day, last match. <laughs> yeah, the last match. When, almost, you, when you're all of a sudden within a point or two, right? Yeah, I was about two points behind, and uh, then the pressure shows back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, uh, If I remember correctly, uh, Richard King was scoring for me, okay? And I'm down to 21 shots. No, 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 no. I had some ciders. And then I left 21 in my box. Because I had to shoot 20. So I always left one, just in case. Just you know in case. I mean? So I had 21. And I told him, I said, well, I have no choice. I got to start. Because I only have 21. So I start. And, you know, Houston can, can, can get pretty wicked. Well, it was wicked that day. And I remember... I remember precisely. I started shooting, shooting, and then I was moving a ring, two rings, two rings, three rings. I mean, I was moving, 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 and I started almost at the center, and I worked my way all the way off the frame, and then I started coming back in, and I never stopped. And I, and I remember one shot I took, and the minute I shot, I was like, oh, it's going to be a nine, and I immediately... Load another one, correct it, and when the target came up, a nine where I had called it, I knew I was behind. I got in front, and I just kept going. Uh, long story short, I dropped two points in that horrendous win, and I'm done. Last <coughs> shot comes up 10 or an X, and I mean, I'm like, whew. you know what it's like when you finish the match, and, and you're like, and you mathematically, you're like, I, I just won. Nobody could can catch me. 
because I was two points ahead. And I'm like, there's no way somebody cleaned that. And even if they did, I had the X's. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I was like, there's no no way. <coughs> so mathematically, I knew I was in a good place. And then Richard King goes, you got one more shot to go. And I look at him and I said, are you kidding me? He goes, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. He, he got me good that day. But yeah, uh, but long story short, it turned out I think you dropped... I mean, you were right there too. You were right there. Yeah. You ended up second or third. I mean, you, you. I you, think so. You came yeah. all the way back. But anyway, at some point, you told me again. I was probably more likely giving you a hard time, and you told me that I had never beat you at a match that mattered. A match that mattered, yeah, a national. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't win a national for two and a half years after that statement. <laughs> well, you didn't beat me for two and a half years after that statement. I remember you would always say that. Uh, that you, you you cursed yourself when 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 you did that. Yeah. yeah you did better at the Worlds <clears throat> with the, when we went to Canada. And I guess you weren't shooting the mid-ranges. I was still winning no. those. Yeah, no, I wasn't right. shooting mid-range. I still don't. Um, yeah, because we shot the Worlds. Well, well, I I won three Texas State championships in a row. Yeah. Right, and you were there, so you couldn't you couldn't get me there. Then we go to the Worlds, I beat you at the Worlds, and then we go to Nationals. Remember, Lodi? And I got third, and you got fourth. Yeah. <laughs> and then it finally, the, the, uh, the curse, I guess, broke, because then after that, man, you just lit it on fire. And then, so what, what, what happened? Did anything change when, at some point, because, I mean, you were always a good shooter, but all of a sudden, you hit another gear. That's when I figured out I was my tuner, my tune charts were off. <clears throat> and uh, the way I do my tune charts, you know, I draw them out on paper. And I was off a little bit. And I didn't figure that out until I was in Phoenix shooting on the electronic target that day, that practice day. Mm -hmm. And then I found it. I was off quite a bit. Mm -hmm. That's why whenever, whenever I was near a data point, it was good. But what I was actually doing, I was jump, uh, jumping tunes at my old chart. So halfway in between data points, it was out of tune. Come back in tune because I was jumping across tunes. So you, so, so it was good enough to make you think you were there. It was but, good enough to make me think I was there. Yeah, but it wasn't exactly. good enough to, to, to let you win. I mean, it, I it couldn't was drive. <clears throat> I couldn't drive through the day with a gun shooting good. It, it either didn't shoot in the morning or it wouldn't shoot in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't hold all day, but once I got that figured out, then they then they started where they'd hold all day. Right. And, uh, it, yeah, very very <clears throat> interesting. And and then you, like I say, you went and piled on. I mean, two Texas State. No, no. Uh, you did win two Texas State championships, right? Or just one? I think I just won the first one. The one. Just the, the one that you set yourself out to win, and that's it. Yeah, I say that's it. I mean, that was quite an accomplishment. Uh, especially and I always gave you, a, I always gave you a good excuse because I never took new barrels to the state championships because I didn't care. I didn't either. <laughs> that was always my that's my reason for not winning. Now, this, a, this barrel, this barrel shot out. I'm just going to take this one. I was, I mean, every time I won, I was fire forming primers. Well, you got to, you got to have, a, you got to have an excuse. <clears throat> but it was a little bit true. I, when I went to the nationals, I had perfect barrels at the amount of rounds I wanted them. I mean, everything was perfect. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I did because it cost so much money. I didn't do that for the state matches. Mm -hmm. I would take my best barrel and, uh, and take it to the match, but I wouldn't do a brand new barrel. I always noticed that, and this is kind of weird, but all those, ma all those nationals I won, except for the first two, uh, Speedy did the barrel that won the two. And then the next four in a row, every time I'd, I'd win a match, I'd win a national, and I'd take the barrel off and put a, a new barrel on. I'd win a national, take it off. Win a national, take it off. I wouldn't shoot a barrel in two nationals. Because if wow. I tried to do it, it seemed like the, either the first – it would shoot good the first day, and the second day it would die. Hmm. Sometimes the third day it would die. Wow. And so I just I stopped doing it. And okay, I'm going to shoot one national <coughs> per barrel, and it comes off. So how many rounds would you put on those barrels, roughly? Six to seven hundred. That's it. When I take them off. So, but I had my own lathe, so I wasn't, you know, I didn't have to pay chambering fees, so I just had right. to buy barrels. 
So yeah, the the uh, let's talk about barrels for a bit. They shoot better. I'm gonna say for the first third of its life, and then they they gradually taper off. And that's the thing, right? It's it's not a it's not a light switch. And uh, you know, I have a I have a barrel that I shot inch and a quarter inch group, five shot group at a thousand yards. Four of those shots were quarter inch. The fifth mm-hmm. one is what opened it up to inch and a quarter. Uh, and it would shoot three and a half inches, 10 shot groups, four, four inch, 10 shot groups, two and a half inches vertical. And it was just a little wide, you know, I mean a thousand yards, right? Mm-hmm. But it shoot uh, consistent four inch groups, two and a half inches tall. And now it, don't get me wrong, it's still a good barrel. But now it does about five, five and a half, which may may still seem good, but it's not. It's hard to win with those barrels. Uh, it's, it's still a really good barrel. <clears throat> if I'm going to the national, I mean, I'm going to win. And a lot of people thought, you know, I, I wasn't very friendly at matches. I wouldn't talk very much. But I was there to win. That was my only focus was to win. I went straight back to the hotel. I would prepping bullets for the next day i was getting my guns cleaned i was trying to figure out what i did wrong that day and trying to correct it you know i messing with my tune chart and uh, then i go to bed i mean everything was about doing the, my best the next day right and uh but the barrels are the same way my, i thought the barrel shot the best between three and six hundred rounds so when i went to the national that barrel had 300 rounds on and and they'll shoot incredible four to five days and when you get out to that fifth day, they just die. Yeah. As far as their ability to win the match, they're still good barrels. But the odds of you winning now just went away. Well, as you know, you know, F class matches are, they're won by X's sometimes, right? Um, exactly. The, uh, you know, you, you touch on the world championship. I mean, you, you know, I don't look at scores during the match, but I afterwards, especially the World Championship, I, I looked at scores. Um, and uh, on team day, I looked at all the team shooters for, you know, worlds. I mean, there was, you know, nations left and right that brought their top shooters, right? And uh, you were not, you were with Team Texas at the time. Mm-hmm. But I looked at your scores. You had the best score <clears throat> for everybody in team day on, on the team. Did you realize that? And I was shooting my backup gun. But did you because realize my, that? My scope went bad on my primary <coughs> gun and I and didn't really have a way to change scopes and get it sighted back in mm-hmm. the way I sight scopes in, which it's a pretty long process. Yeah. Um, getting them right. So tall target. Yeah. Tall target test and everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we just covered that on our, on our, Members on my website, I have a members area, and we just spent four episodes on mounting scope. Very, it's, very important. It's, <sighs> it's one of those think. things. It's one of those things that it gets overlooked quite often, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, everybody wants to focus on the load, the load, the load. But if I mean, you may have a, you may have a Hummer barrel. And you may have a scope that's mounted incorrectly, and you just wasted that entire barrel. Or you, you, you might be throwing away championships simply because you don't want to take the time to mount a scope properly. I think the scope's one of the big thing, things overlooked, and the, your front rest and your rear bag is huge, mm-hmm. hugely overlooked. I have the same bag I've had. I, th- I bet you I'm going on 10 years with that rear bag. Because I went through so many bags and so much testing, and once I found it and I changed it and I filled it up and took sand out, put sand in, and finally, and I'm like, that's it. So I don't know what I'm gonna do when that thing <laughs> wears out. But I remember putting in so much work. Now I'm kind of just on cruise control, you know. Uh, I just I just don't change anything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But. You told me a story about where uh, you couldn't get your rifle to shoot and somebody let you borrow a different bag or something, a rear bag. Mm-hmm. 
And that was right before the state championship match. Mm-hmm. I actually was walking down. I was I was shooting with the bench press guys, and I walked down and looked at everybody's stuff, trying to figure out what I liked the best. And I found I thought I think I really liked this bag setup. And I I turned around and I said, "Who who's shooting spots this?" And it was one of my buddies. I said, "Can I shoot here?" And I was down there on mine shooting half inch groups. And I carried my gun down and put it on his rest, and I shot about an eighth inch group. <laughs> and this is the week before the state championship. Wow. And I just looked at him. I said, Mike, my, I got the same rest as you do, but I need this bag. And I said, I'm going to the state championship next week and I need this bag with me. <laughs> and he's laughing. He goes, he goes, take it. And uh, so, that was the last piece I needed to get my gun to shoot. Tommy. What, what did he say after you found you won the Texas state championship with his Bring bag? My bag back? <laughs> he wanted his bag back. But he was happy to help me out. I mean, yeah, it was, it was very nice of him to let me do that. So, uh, when was it? Two thousand and something. I had a, I had a, a what was it? A, a RCBS or something? A, a bench rest, front rest that they had. And uh, I mean, I had this huge feed on it and everything. You know, back then, um, Seb wasn't as popular as it is now. But a friend of mine bought a Seb, and he had issues on day one, and I shot, I don't know, kind of my normal scores, which was kind of on a Palma day, about four, 430s, 438. You know, I dropped mm-hmm. seven to 10 points. That was just kind of my my regular, right? My normal uh, as a new shooter. I mean, I was trying, but that, I couldn't get better than that. Long story short, he can't, he can't shoot the next day, and he had a Seb rest, the, the, the original Seb. And he says, you want to borrow my rest? He goes, I'm, he goes, I'm leaving. You can just keep. I said, sure. You know, I'm already out. What? I'm, I'll, I'll play with it. It's pretty. I shot a 448. Man. I, 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 I won the day. And uh, I shot a 448. And I dropped those points at 900. I cleaned 1,000. And I thought, guess what I bought the next day? A Seb rest. You know? Yeah. And that's when, that's when it hit me. That's when I realized, holy crap. I it's need, very important. I need good equipment. You got to have good equipment. And one of the things people don't realize, if you if you look at your gun set up on the firing line, and you look at the back of your bag, and if you just say, okay, the where the gun sits in the back of the bag, that's the pivot point. And if you go up two and a half feet, say, to your front bag, if if you grab your gun side to side, move it, say it moves four thousandths of an inch side to side, and you th- that's a human hair. All right. And you think, well, that's okay. <clears throat> but if you take a thousand yards, which is 3,000 feet, divided by two and a half feet, I think that's 12, about 1,200 times, times that by 4,000. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. Should be about four and a half inches. <laughs> 4.8. Oh, you're, you're, you're random, off by th- A random movement you just put in your gun for windage. Yeah. You see how important that is? Very, very important. And that's just four thousands. What if it's uh, ten thousands? Some people like to say, well, I like my gun to free recoil. I'll leave mine a little loose. Well, I just smile. <laughs> okay. Right? Like, good job. Yeah, that, that works. Yeah, if it works for you. Yeah. So, uh, speaking of that, are you, were you a, a hard holder? Or uh, obviously, you don't free recoil, I, I assume, by that statement. I, I try as hard as I can not to touch the gun, except on my shoulder. And one of the things when, you, when I'm setting my gun up, when you lean into the gun a little bit, if your crosshair moves, when you lean just a little bit of pressure, something's wrong. And sometimes I can't get rid of it. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll move my bag, I'll move me, I'll change my angle. But if you, you've got to get to where you can just push with your shoulder a little bit with no movement in your crosshair, none. And once you're there, you'll be surprised on how good your gun shoots. Because if it's moving when you push a little bit, the second that gun fires, it moves. It's the opposite. I mean, you pushed on it, it moved. When it pushes on you, it moved. So you got to be able to lean into the gun and see no movement in the crosshair. And it's even better once you fire the gun and your shoulder pushes it back forward. If you don't end up exactly where you are aiming on the target, something's wrong. And sometimes you'll see me down there fiddling with my gun because something's wrong. And I'm moving stuff. I'm 
I'm picking up my rear bag and brushing the rocks out from under it. I'm doing something's wrong. And once I get it set up to work, it returns the battery every time and I can lean in it just a little bit. It, it shoots incredible. I've seen so, you break down your entire setup and start over. Something was wrong. And I could just lean it into the gun. That's usually what I'm looking for. You push on it with your shoulder a little bit. If that crosshair is moving to the left or right, it's wrong. Something's not right. It, it can't do that. Right. And because that's a huge, I mean, and it, and it might move four or five inches when you do that. And I'm not pushing that hard. Right. So when I, I lean into the gun just a little bit, but I'm not pushing real hard. I, I'm trying not to upset the gun. And the only other part of my body that is touching the gun is my finger, my trigger finger. And I have a separate bag sitting under my hand to support my hand so that I can just pull the trigger, uh, just my finger. Mm -hmm. So I got light pressure on my shoulder and my fingers touching the trigger. That's it. Any other, you know, I see people gripping it with their hand. If you can't grip it with your hand exactly the same every shot, you've got problems. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and you're probably gonna, you're probably going to have vertical problems. That's how I shoot. I, I grab it, but uh, it took me a long time to learn how to shoot it consistently. I mean, a long time. That was one of the, probably the hardest things I had to do. And I started having to grip it when I went to Magnums. You know, back in 2013, we were uh, required to shoot Magnums on the oh, US yeah, rifle yeah. team. And I couldn't free recoil Magnum. I, I just couldn't. So I said, well, I guess I'll grip it. And I started gripping it. But I spent probably a, a whole barrel's life worth of uh, uh, training at 100 yards, shooting groups, shooting groups. And it, I mean, it's it just the most minute thing. But now I, I'm pretty confident, you know, I can, you know, I can shoot. I can lay down, like I said, with my rifle and shoot good groups. But it was a, it was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a lot of work because you're trying to do something difficult. Right. That's probably what it is. That's the problem. You were trying to grip the gun, and, and you have to do it exactly the same every shot. I want the other route. I, I wanted the front bag to grip the gun. So I see everybody on the on the firing line with these white slick bags on the front of the rest, on the front rest. Well, it's not gripping nothing. I've got the right. roughest, coarsest bag I can get on the front. And I've got that thing. It's like a vice. Mm -hmm. I've got it clamped. It's it's tight. That's how I run mine. Oh, uh, if you know how I know when it's not tight, because it kicks harder. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I forgot to, I forgot to tighten, tighten my bag. Tighten it down. It, it literally reduces the recoil. Yeah, and that's I what had, I'm trying. To, I want that front bag to help me with the kick. I had to actually modify my my ears on my on my Seb to to help with that and uh of course i didn't tell anybody you, i'm first time i'm telling anybody but i modified uh, mine too mine's all <laughs> but uh one day i was shooting with brian bowling and he i mean he, his gun was shooting tall it was shooting so bad that i offered him my gun i said man you can i said i have another gun you can shoot my gun you know I mean, I like Brian. He's a good guy, and and he, guy. I know he doesn't like to shoot bad. I don't think none of us like to shoot bad, and he 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 was just having issues. So anyway, I go to the pits and I come back, and I said, "You want to shoot?" He goes, "No, no, I'll shoot this one." And I mean, that thing was tight, and I'm like, "Of course, he shot great." And then I asked him, "What the heck did you do?" They said, did you, "Did you turn your tuner?" And he goes, "He goes every time I shoot with you, I learn something." I said, what did you do? He says, I saw how you had your bag set up in the front. So while I, while, during, the, during the, the prep time and, and the pit change and everything, he ripped his stuff apart and, and pretty much made it like mine. And all of a sudden, he couldn't believe that, it. That front bag setup is very, very important if you want to win. Very important. <laughs> yeah, only if you want to win. <laughs> only if you want to win. <laughs> I love Seb Ress. I love him. Uh, when I got my Neo, uh, I had to modify it in the front. And uh, this, it was it was causing the gun. I couldn't keep the gun tight. I'd shoot four or five shots and the gun's loose. I'd reach up there and I'd tighten yeah, it Yeah, because the sand, the sand would migrate. <clears throat> yeah. 
And if you if you take the front bag out, I, sh- I don't know if I should tell everybody this, but no, I'm not shooting now. <laughs> if you if you turn the side adjustment and look at what it was doing, instead of it's it had that those steel plates and they were pushing like this, yeah, it it's actually up. picking the gun up, and it wouldn't <laughs> stay tight. So I had to take that plate and take the screw out and flip it upside down, re-drill it, and put it in the other way. I, I, now it was going this way. Yeah, I made mine different, uh, and same deal. I had a different problem. Well, I had that problem because I had to get it really tight. Because, you know, I mean, obviously, it, it's it's funny that you and I both found out the same thing because we like to tighten it. And when you tighten it, it pushes, like you said, it pushes the gun up. And yep. a few a few shots, I had to reach up there every three, four shots. And that was part of my process. Reach up there, tighten the back, reach up there. But then by the time I got to the end, uh, I couldn't get the gun. Like if I tried to lift it straight up, I couldn't because my 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 wrist is, or my forearm is like this. It's flat on yeah. the sides, but it's like this. Well, it, it have so much sand would migrate to the top that, you know, pretty much it was illegal by the time I got done. So I eliminated the bags completely, reworked those angles, and now it just pushes straight in. Okay. I can clamp the bag. I can clamp the rifle completely where you can't pull it back, but yet you pick it right out of the out of the deal. Yeah. And uh, and that <clears throat> from that day it just went away, like my issues. You got to modify pretty much everything. I mean. That's the, I, I think the sub rest are the best rest out there, but I just I had to tweak it just a little bit to fit fit that magnum. Well, some guys are, are going about it a different way. They're they're having this rest, uh, not the rest, but the stocks with really tall sides, mm-hmm. and obviously that helps. But if, yeah, like helps. mine, mine only has a flat about this much, and obviously it's at the bottom, so it'll it'll push it up. Yep, that's how mine is. Mine's about a half inch on the side. And then it dishes in. Right. So. You still shooting that? Well, you, you had that Robertson, but now you were sh- you went to the Speedy Stocks? Yeah, I went to the Speedy Stocks, yeah. So all four of my – I built six F-Glass guns, and the first two were Robinsons, and then the next four were uh, Speedies. Speedy. Yeah. So what was uh, – what was it like when you started dealing with Speedy? Because, you know, I think he helped you quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I went to Larry's school, uh, that F-class school, for a week. And uh, Speedy was the gunsmith instructor there. Mm-hmm. So anytime we were on breaks, I, mean, I, I knew kind of who he was. Every time we were on breaks, I was down there talking to him. Mm-hmm. And half the time, I was coming back to class late because we'd get talking about something I didn't want to stop. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then we got talking one day, and he goes, you bring your gun with you? And I said, well, yeah, we're going to shoot at the end of the week. And he goes, bring it over to my house. He goes, I'm going to look at it. And uh, he showed me some stuff. And uh, I went ahead and shot the last day of class. We went to the 1,000-yard range and shot. And he told me that week, he said, when you're done this week, he said, just bring the gun over to me before you go home. And and you can come back and get it in a couple of weeks. And so I did. And it, and it shot better when I got it back. And... Uh, from that point on, he built every one of my guns. It, it wasn't a question who was going to build it. Until uh, you started he building them, right? He, he, he built all of them. Yeah. Uh, and he he was a he was a Hall of Fame bench rest shooter. So still is. He would, <laughs> still is a Hall of Fame bench rest shooter. But he helped me a lot in all those years. And, and uh, he would he would tell me about anything if I could ask the question. He would give me an answer for it. Yeah. And uh, that's the. Uh, I love talking to Speedy. He's just he's just so busy, man. But oh, just you know, we'll just you know how it is, right? You just start talking and just time just flies because he, yeah. he he'll just let you he'll just let you have the info if you ask the right questions. Sometimes he he kind of you gotta ask him the right question. Then once I it, it's almost like a like a switch. Once you ask that one question, he'll give you that little smile and off he goes. Yeah. Every now and then, I'd find a question. Every now and then, he he would work his way around without answering it. Well, that's what I'm so saying. I knew that was a good that was a good question. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, you you, you got to ask the right one because oftentimes he'll kind of, uh, you know, if it's a really good one, he'll kind of work around it. Uh, but yeah. I mean, I I have huge respect for Speedy and his knowledge. So, 
So the rest, right? Super important. Why, obviously you had huge success with your 284. Why go to the 300? That's a pretty good question. Uh, I just, uh, one of the things I, one of the reasons was I saw a guy the year before I started shooting F-Class, he won the, the F-Class Nationals with a 300 WSM out Derek, in San Diego. Derek Rogers. Derek Rogers. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck in the back of my head. And then I watched, uh, in 20, I think it was 2016, I watched Emil, Coven, oh, and, mm -hmm. and Siraz battle it out for the, for the uh, national Canadian National with 300 WSMs. And I was just I'm driving home. I had 2,200 miles to drive home. I'm th I thought about it all the way home. I'm thinking, you got to build a 300 and, mm -hmm. and at least try it. Yeah. And uh, what I found is I don't, I never thought that. Now, I had a couple of 300 barrels that I don't think I've ever seen barrels more accurate. But what I was noticing with the uh, 300 is that I either won the match or I finished 13th or below. There was no top 10. Mm -hmm. It either shot good enough to win <clears throat> or I did horrible. And the 284, I never finished below sixth place for five years in the Nationals. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that always bothered me when I switched to the uh, 300. And uh, it didn't, a lot of it was, you know, the rest, the front rest. When you got into the Magnums, everything was amplified. Now your front rest is far more important. How you handle the gun is far more important because the Magnum just amplified everything. And so I almost had to learn how to shoot better because of the Magnum. It was harder to shoot, but we had to shoot them because the – Team USA. Uh -huh. And uh, so I actually, uh, two years ago, started moving back towards the 284. Uh, and I think I found some stuff. The reason I didn't like the 284, the main reason I got away from the 284 is I got tired of neck turning brass every year. Because uh -huh. I'd get four firings on my brass and I'd throw it in the trash. Primers wouldn't stay in. Mm -hmm. And I was just tired of throwing Lapua brass away after four firings. And I knew if I went to the Magnum, I don't ever throw brass away now. Hmm. Uh, my 300, uh, I sold one of my 300s a couple months ago, and I sold him all the brass and dies and reamers, sold him everything that won those last three nationals. And uh, that brass was perfect after nine firings. Wow. And, and the ESs uh, were still good when you size it. The uh, headspace on the brass was perfect. I mean, the brass was getting better and better. And that's what the bench rest guys always told me. The bench rest guys would shoot their brass 200 times because they weren't hurting the brass. And, and they, they used to tell me the brass gets better and better and better. But I never had a gun that I could ever test that theory until I got to the 300. I think it irons out all the high spots, right? Oh, it, it I mean, slowly you're, you're hammering it down, hammering yeah. it down, hammering it down. It just slowly makes the brass <clears> better, <throat> and uh, so that's that was the other reason I wanted to move to the Magnum, and uh, and I think it was a good choice. Uh, when I when I just told you I moved back to a 284, it's actually a Magnum case uh, with the same volume, same water volume as a Shaheen. Took me four years to find the case. I finally found it. That sounds like a seven PRC. That's what exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six five PRC. Next out to the seven. Yeah, uh, I have one. I have one coming. Uh, a reamer. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's going to be the next big thing, the seven PRC. I think so too. I mean, because uh, we know the two eighty four shoots. We just yeah. needed a case. We needed a case. With the same volume, that was a Magnum. And, uh, well, it's just, you just wanted a fatter. Uh, the, uh, th there's, I guess we're letting a lot of cats out of the bag today, but. Yeah, probably the, too many. You might have to go back and eat some of those. <laughs> uh, it's going to be hard to put this toothpaste back in the tube. But uh, I know of a few 7 PRCs that have been out for a while now, and they shoot. The one gun, you know, I'm selling all my stuff, F-class stuff. When I'm 
when I'm done selling, I'll still technically have one gun, one one front rest, one rear bag, and everything I need to go to a nationals. Mm -hmm. So I'm selling out, but I'm keeping one of exactly. I'll still be able to go if I decide I want to go to a national again. I'm not sure I'll ever go again, but mm -hmm. I can. And it's that's the gun. Yeah, that's the one I'm keeping. Yeah, it uh, it's uh, it's proving quite impressive so far. Yeah, uh, you'll like it. Well, that's my next it, one. It was it was shooting. It was in the point ones and break in. Mm -hmm. The other the last time I, I haven't shot my F class guns in probably almost a year. Yeah, but it was in the point ones. Yeah, point one three, point one five groups. Yeah, as I was breaking the barrel. <clears throat> Yeah, shoot three shots, go clean the barrel. Go shoot six shots, go clean the barrel. Shoot nine shots, go clean the barrel. Uh -huh. So it wasn't the optimum uh, time to be doing powder testing in groups, but I was just doing it for fun. Right, right. And because uh, I could, I mean, I, I loaded 50 rounds and I had three different powder charges and I was just, you know, playing. Yeah. And But it was shooting good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. You, you get you get the speed, you get the low pressure, you get the good brass life. I mean, Lapua's got brass now. Le yeah, Le I, and I don't have Lapua brass yet. I still got the original. Yeah, I think I had Horner Day. Yeah, no, we, it's still Lepua, still shot good. Lapua released the six five PRC brass, um, and uh, like I said, uh, I think there's a lot of cats being let out today, but uh, they're out there, and uh, I know of them, and I. I know how well they're doing, and I think that's going to be a next big one. When we watch the video, if you get to that conversation, I, and then we hear a beep, <laughs> we will know what you were doing. <laughs> so, you you like to tinker, obviously, right? You, you're always looking for the next big thing, even though you were winning. What what is that just in in your nature that that you're just never satisfied? Yeah, I just I think I can do better. I mean, but it's like, I mean, I did enough racing and stuff in the past that if you weren't trying to stay ahead of everybody, you were going to get left behind. And uh, you see that. You see a lot of good shooters out there that stop doing load development. and uh, They just load the same load they've been loading for six years. And they ignored the fact that powder lots change your velocity and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, they stop winning. Yeah. So you've got to stay ahead. I was always just trying to find, and that was part of the fun for me, just trying to figure out new things. I mean, I'm an engineer. I, I hate to admit it, but I am an engineer, and uh, I like coming up with new ideas. And uh, there's stuff on my guns. I, people didn't notice, but in 2016, I started putting a wooden box in my shooting cart. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my guns were at. So I'd take the gun coffin, out of the box. The, the, coffin. the coffin. People I, were calling I, it the coffin. Yeah. <clears throat> it was there so you couldn't look at my guns. <laughs> That's the whole reason it was there. I take the gun out, I go to the firing line, all the top shooters are on the same relay. So you're over there putting your yeah. gun set up. I shoot my seven minutes and I take my gun and put it back in the box. There's stuff all over my guns that are very important. And you didn't want nobody to see. Didn't want them to see it. Because the second you looked at it, you go, I know exactly what he's done. And I didn't want people to see it, so I just carry it right back, put it back in my box. And, I remember uh, one day, one day I walked up to you, uh, and I I noticed that 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 I'm gonna call it a toe strap that you had on your front wrist. Right in the, the middle. The what? A toe strap. It was like a nylon strap right on your front wrist, right in the middle. Oh yeah, yeah. To keep it from crowning. Keep and it in I the look, back. From and I looked at I I, I just looked at it, I said, oh, that's a good idea, and you're like. Give me that. And you, <laughs> you hit it. Oh, that, that was funny. Uh, oh, threw a, threw a towel over the Yeah, or something. I probably like, was just messing with you. Yeah. Because uh, it, it was, the, the rest was in plain sight most of the time, but I was yeah. probably messing with you. Yeah, but probably. See, the probably, the, it's, it's, it's what gets me every time. Probably. Um, yeah, so it, there's, there's, uh, I, I'm I'm gonna admit I'm one of those that that lately for the last few years has kind of just took it easy and go you know what this works I'm just gonna keep doing this uh, I just uh, 
the 2017 cycle really burned me out you know leading yeah. up to the 2017 cycle it really burned me out um it was, it's a lot of work to shoot well it's a yeah. lot of work it's a lot and, of work a lot of money i mean and uh you know i i you know what my goal was to do well at worlds right and then what a month later or so i went to to uh to lodi mm -hmm. and uh that was i said okay i'm gonna shoot lodi and then i'm just gonna take it easy and and uh i did really well lodi as well and then after that i just kind of been just relaxing because uh, you know the next world championship, they keep pushing it back, pushing it back, and uh, you know I don't know. I ho hopefully it'll happen next year, but now I'm, I'm about I'm like okay, it's time to get get back into it. You know what I mean? It's it's time to because you don't decide you're gonna go win a world championship or even any any big match. You don't decide the month before. You have to decide the the work has to be started six eight months in advance at least oh absolutely and that's where yeah. i'm at i'm like okay okay it's it's about time to to start you know and if you got three or four guns you almost want to test all three or four of them with brand new barrels and uh see which one's the best i mean you gotta you gotta take your best stuff and you gotta figure out which one's the best which one's gonna shoot the best and, yeah and uh, the problem with worlds uh as you know it's you're going to be shooting for about six or seven days. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and as you pointed out already, it's really hard to keep a gun in tune for that long. Six days, I'd have to take two guns. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, it won't make it. It won't make it six days. So, so since we're letting cats out of the bag, um, World Championship 2017, I took one rifle. And I shot the same thing all the way through teams and everything. Okay. And uh, was it a 284? That's Shehane. Yeah. 284. 284s will go. <clears throat> a 284 will go. If you got a good shooting 284, they'll go 1,500, 1,800 rounds. Well, I. Depending had, on your, if your velocity is not too high. Well, I had 1,200 on mine when I showed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, during the Nationals, and in the in the Team USA team match, uh, I was uh, I, I realized I, I fell out of tune. So then I I, you know, reached for the tuner and I retuned it, and immediately I mean it was like a light switch because the the, the first match that we did after that was the uh, 700 yard or 700 meter World Championship, the first you know it was supposed to be a Palma, and we shot mm -hmm. the first one and I. I think I shot better than everybody else. And then we got that rain. So then we didn't shoot the rest of the day. So I ended up right. winning. I shot one time, but you know, I ended up winning the day. But uh, much more than that, it told me, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm there. And, you know, when, when you shoot, even at 700 meters, and which is 800 yards uh, roughly, when you can beat everybody at a world championship, you're like, Okay, the gun's in tune. It just gives you the confidence, right? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And the beauty, the, the beauty about Canada is you don't have those temperature swings as much as we we do in Phoenix, or even Raton. Yeah, the, Canada wasn't my range. That, Phoenix is my range. That's where I love Phoenix, and there's yeah. that's there's reasons for it. But right. I couldn't read the flags in Canada for nothing, and I couldn't see the Mirage. I don't know what it was about that range up there, but it was it, it was the toughest range for me for the way I shoot. You know what I found out during nationals, uh, the Canadian nationals leading up to the world championship, that I kept saying there's there's half a MOA out there that 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 I don't see. It just for some reason there's a half a MOA that that just I don't know where. So then uh, what I started doing is I just started adding that half MOA. For example, if I'd say, well, I think that's a left three, I'd go left four. I'm like, okay, that's left three plus that mysterious half MOA, and I just add it. And that, that, that's all me. you needed? Believe it or not. It, 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 and you know, it only takes a few times before you go, don't change, keep doing that, you know? And on the last day, when it was real windy, I kept doing that. Like somehow I was half MOA off. Uh, 
Like there was this half a moe, I just called it half a moe that was just out of nowhere. And I just had to keep adding it. If I, if I said left four, then I give it left five. Yeah, I'm surprised remember, you didn't reach up and just turn your scope. Cool. Give it the half. Well, it was just, I didn't want to, because, you know, it was, it was pair fire, right? Yeah. So I didn't want to dial my scope because I'm like, uh, I don't know what I have to do next time, you know? So I, I didn't dial my scope. Uh, but I, I remember that, that I had to keep adding that half a moi. And you know what? Uh, I was down two points in that real windy stuff. Last, last match of the, of the championship. I was down two points. And on the last shot, I said, you know, oh, that's a left five or whatever. And I said, well, I'm going to give it six. And I go, no, no, I'll still catch the five. I'll be fine. And even if I don't, I'll still hit a four. I'm just afraid that I'm giving it too much because I was out there, you know, left six, right? So I didn't give it. And, I, and my last shot at the World Championship was a four <laughs> because I didn't add that. Uh, it didn't matter. But it didn't matter. Uh, the next the next competitor above me was two points, so it didn't matter. But I remember that vividly because, uh, you know, all of a sudden I tried to play it safe. And, you know, that's never a good plan. No, pressure always gives you bad decisions. <laughs> so, you know, now that you uh, pretty much retired from F-Class, what, what, what would you say is one thing that you learned that you were glad that you did F-Class? Uh, the thing I probably learned the best, when I first started shooting F-Class, all I could think about is winning the national. And if you looked at how my life was laid out, shooting was my first priority. Winning, winning the national, that was my first priority. Uh, my family was, uh, probably work was second. My family was third. And God was fourth. And when I finally realized about 2014, that I was had everything backwards, uh, that God was first, family was second, work was third, and shooting was last. When I finally got that right, that's actually when I started winning nationals. I didn't win a single national before I got my priorities right. Because once I got my priorities right and I had shooting last, to where shooting doesn't matter, it, it comes last, that actually fixed my mental game. And that was, for those first four or five years, that was my problem. My guns would win. My loads would win. My tune would win. My tune charts were off a little bit, but it was always my mental game. I dropped a couple of shots and I would get mad inside and then I dropped a couple more. It was always my mental game was wrong. And once I corrected that to where I didn't, I didn't really care so much about winning, uh, everything just fell in place. And I started winning matches. And uh, that was probably the thing I, I enjoyed learning the most. It got, I got my life kind of in order halfway through my F-class shooting time. And I, and I actually learned that I was listening to some uh, tapes driving to Phoenix. 15-hour drive. I had plenty of time to listen to stuff. And I was listening mm -hmm. to some tapes. And I, actually, for the next four or five years, before I'd come to the match, I'd buy a whole stack of those tapes at our church, and I would pass them out at the matches if anybody that wanted one. And uh, it was the tapes that taught me how to get my life in order and what was really, really important. And you and I have talked about that a few times about family and, uh, you know, not putting work in front of our families. And, and you know, you just, you just got to have your priorities right. And uh, But the sad part oh, yeah. is uh, – when I learned that shooting wasn't important, I also started losing interest in shooting. And I would have quit in 2015. Before I even started winning, I would have quit. Mm -hmm. But something kind of kept telling me to keep going. And the longer I shot, you know, I was winning, so I wanted to keep going. <coughs> but inside, I didn't even really want to go. So when I'd go to the match, there was no pressure to win. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any pressure because I didn't really want to be there. But I was still going because I was on Team Grizzly. I wanted to support them. And so I just kept going. And then finally, a couple of years ago, I just – that feeling of not wanting to go just finally got to the point I just don't want to go. And so I finally, finally decided to quit. I quit probably a year and a half ago, but I 
I, I finally told Deborah in August, I said, I guess if I'm, if I'm really have quit, I guess I'll just start selling equipment. Mm-hmm. And I said, then you'll know I actually did quit. So, <laughs> so I even sold my lathe about two weeks ago. We loaded it up. It, my lathe's in uh, Tennessee now. Wow. One of my, one of the guys that originally helped me, one of the original bench rest guys, he bought my lathe. And, uh, but that was probably the thing I, I, uh, most enjoy about F class shooting was those long drives to the matches and getting to listen to uh, audio tapes. And I actually, uh, for a couple of years, had the entire Bible on a jump drive. Mm-hmm. And I would listen to the Bible driving to the matches. And so I, I would get to the matches nice and calm. You know, I'd have my priorities right and uh, just sit there and shoot, do my best, take my medal and go home. <laughs> Yeah, you took a lot of them, man. Uh, again, I'm I'm very impressed with what you did. Uh, obviously, huge respect for for you uh, and 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 your accomplishments. And uh, you know, I'm just glad that uh, we became friends. And uh, and uh, you know, it was always good to see you uh, to this day. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And uh, you know, you uh, I you know what I enjoyed about you is especially like you talk about towards the end. Uh, at first, we would just give each other crap all the time, right? Because we were both trying to win, right? But towards the end, we would just have conversations that had nothing to do with shooting. Yeah. And that that was some of the best talks you and I had. Uh, yeah. Just just good stuff, man. Good stuff. John, thank you so much for doing this, man. I appreciate it. I know I know uh, you're, so, you're real busy, but this is going to help a lot of people. It's going to get a lot of people, hopefully... I know it will uh, to to really start thinking about their priorities and uh, and uh, you know hearing it from someone like you that won what six seven eight national championships six and six individuals and I think we won four or five team yeah, nationals so, so one you know. of the things that that I, I shouldn't say this but one of the things I enjoyed the most is when I'd see somebody lose their temper on the firing line uh, that was a good shooter and the second I would see it. I could just, right, they're done. They might as well go home. They're not winning. Yeah. And uh, you, if you want to do well, you've got to have your priorities right. Keep shooting where it actually belongs as a hobby and have fun. But if you start taking it too seriously, which I did for five years, uh, I had zero nationals for five years and I was taking it too seriously. Once I started putting it in its place, I started having more fun. I started talking to people, you know, and, and enjoying myself more to matches. And, and, and then that's when I started doing uh, really well. So, <clears throat> you know, Todd keep Hendricks. Keep it where it belongs. Todd Hendricks, uh, he won the Nationals last year. And then yeah. he won the Southwest, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I was glad to see that. He's, I don't know if there, anybody's working any harder than he is trying to win. He's, he is working hard at it. Yeah, and uh, but I when I interviewed him, he said he said that what changed for him was talking to you. Uh, he said that's when you told him just quit worrying about it. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. And look at him now. I mean, he's uh, he's winning. We had that conversation in the pits. I think it was that maybe <clears throat> might have been at Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, just don't worry about it. Just enjoy yourself. And uh, if you make a bad shot, just ignore it. Yep. Move on. And uh, you'll do much better. Yeah, for sure. Right. It works. John, thank you. Uh, if I catch you again, we're going to do it again. Okay. <laughs> this, I know there's a lot more, man, to, to still to unpack. Um, you didn't think we let enough cats out of the bag yet? There was a lot of cats. There was a lot of cats. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I'll be in touch, man. Okay. Thank you, John. Talk to you you later. All right. Bye-bye.